it is time to introduce the cast and creatives behind the project. We have Kieran Hines, Katrina Balfe, Jamie Dornan, young Jude Hill, and our writer, director, and producer, Sir Kenneth Brana. Hello, everybody. Uh, hi. Hi there. Well, the end of the film, of course, ends on a quite an emotional note. Uh, Kenneth, you, you dedicate this, this film to the ones who stayed, the ones who left, and the ones who were lost. Um, this is such a personal project, one that you kind of based upon your own life and experience. Why was it so important uh, to add that dedication there at the end and, and to really get a chance uh, to tell your story this way? Well, I think um, compassion was the point of view that we wanted to apply to this very complicated situation. We look at it through uh, Jude's portrayal of nine-year-old Buddy, and it's a very human and humane position from which to watch a family, which hopefully many people can recognize, deal with events that really we're not trained to deal with, overwhelming political and social events that are in the end for that part of the world, the north of Ireland, a, a very traumatic period across the following 30 years. Nobody knew how long it was going to last then. Uh, but everybody has their relationship to it. Some decided that they had to or needed to or were forced to leave or be displaced. Others found their way of living through a very changed world that was now tense and, you know, alert in ways that none of us are really ready for and takes an enormous and different kind of courage. And through it all, of course, both people away and people there lost quite literally 3,700 people during that 30-year uh, period. So it was deeply tragic and painful. But the film tries to understand a little of that, but doesn't take on the bigger issue. Instead, tries to stay with what were the coping mechanisms and what were the ways, the tiny ways in which a so-called ordinary family, no family is ordinary, every family is extraordinary, every person is, but how, how do they find a way through um, that kind of difficulty and put one foot in front of the other? And from those kind of stories of which I've heard many in my life, I think we can often learn. And in this case, because of uh, the beautiful performances of this group of actors, there was a sort of sense that we were represented in the film by hearts and minds and souls that were, I think, very uh, rich and uh, I think hopefully, you know, paid due deference and service to, to all of those people who were connected uh, in, this, uh, in this event that was so important in our lives. I think that is the thing. It's, it's, while it is a very personal story to you, it is a story that people relate to because they see their own families. They see various forms of their family struggles. Um, but I'm going to start with the person who does uh, represent most uh, your experience, Kenneth, and, and Jude here uh, in playing this young buddy. You know, what was it about this story uh, that when you first read it that you liked so much? What was it about Buddy that you just liked? Well, I think me and Buddy can relate a lot. And I saw myself in those pages of that first draft of the script. And a couple words into the script, I immediately fell in love with it. And to have my first project being this important and with all of these fantastic people in the cast as well, that I met on along the way and it was just I just felt so lucky to be here lucky and talented and all of all of the things that caused you to uh best 300 folks was that is that that number around right Kenneth about 300 young boys you looked at and then found this diamond yeah, it was 300. The Jude was incredibly uh, patient. What was the most frustrating part of the audition procedure, uh, Jude? Did you get fed up at the beginning? Did you ever go, you know, I've had enough. I've done this so many times. I couldn't be less interested. <laughs> no, every single call, I just, I just loved every single Zoom call, every single video tip, and I, I enjoyed it. Like, I enjoyed every single one. And when I found out that I'd gotten it, I was so happy. What was the first Zoom tape that you had to do? Do you remember what the scene was? I think 
I think it, this was my first Zoom tape with Ken, and it was the scene where Buddy and Pat are at Pop's wake, and they're having the talk about Pop, and it's all very emotional. And that scene, even in the drafts, you could definitely read a few words in and know that it's very important to both characters and Buddy. Who read that scene with you? Who read Pa's part when you when you did the Zoom? <laughs> it was Ken. Oh, hi, was Ken. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You know who who really gave you more of the Pa vibe? Was it Jamie or Ken? Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Both were very similar. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ken, what do you remember about seeing um, Jude, like Jude, as you said, this was your very first film role. Uh, you get on set, you you have recreated your childhood, and then you see this young boy uh, kind of portraying what you went through. What do you remember about seeing him from the other end of the monitor for the first time? Um, I I think uh, it was actually part of seeing that the film would become something else in a good way. It's so nice of you to say, uh, and we've been so pleased to hear that other people do get something from the movie. And I think it's because it does move away from what might be the narrow confines of some sort of completely direct to recreation of experiences of mine. I felt that Jude and Katrina, Jamie, uh, uh, Kieran, they, they made the they made the parts their own, you know, they brought, they brought things to them that surprised me. So they uh, ultimately it became a much more emotional experience when I put it all together. But in the doing of it, I was sort of continually surprised. And I loved that they were very open, these actors, almost, well, everybody had a scene very early on, or a, we called it a test or whatever, like a test day, like it's just there's no pressure and no anything. But in fact, most of what we did on those test days ended up in the movie. Um, and it was, you know, uh, Ma outside the house or Pa with, with, with Buddy, which we shot on the first day. And I try, think I tried to persuade Jamie, this will never be in a movie. It's just a kind of a practice. And uh, it's bang in the middle of the movie. Uh, Kieran also was really game for just sort of saying, look, um, I'm, we're, we're going to put the camera on. I'm just going to yell some things at you. I know you've never been on set before or played a word of this part before, but could you just respond? And they did. But of course, in so doing, they started to respond as their version of Ma, their version of Pa, their version of Pop, and their version of Buddy. And it started to own, own the parts and be and set a kind of tone, which goes back to what you were saying, that, that is that is playful, recognizable, somehow, you know, human and 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 stopped it being too solemn. So I do salute all of these actors were so sort of game and then brave and 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 with that came a sense of fun and play which also goes into the atmosphere of the film all right jamie then what do you remember about that first test day and uh tapping in to pa uh just the very sincere sense that i'll be fired <laughs> <laughs> soon as i you know there's anything audible coming out of my mouth um yeah, you know, it was, it, was a, <laughs> it was clever by Ken to to do it that way, and and you know, there was an easing of pressure not seeing that day as day one, that actually then maintained the whole shoot. You know, as a result, we sort of felt like there was never a day one, and we were eased in, and uh, there's a sort of comfortableness amongst us all that was gained really early on that. Uh, took a lot of the pressure off I guess and um, so it was um, it was all very um, it was all very well thought out <laughs> like and I don't know if you do that with all of your movies but it was very it was very very clever and, and it, it, it felt like before you knew it you were off and running and you had formed these relationships and we were off to the races without ever feeling like day one take one here we go you know so yeah. You know, Jamie, years ago I worked with the, uh, Sir John Mills, legendary actor, he'd done a hundred and so movies, uh, and I said, What's, what, you, what have you found to be the biggest problem? He said, fear, fear is no good to anybody actor, and it's what we feel all the time. So a lot of my directing, uh, you know, ask, whatever you call it, things I've picked up is to do with coming from my background, is how can you just, how can you make the actor less fearful and genuinely enjoy things? Because when I feel 
And when I see and feel people enjoy things, I see them do their best work. And I also see them surprise themselves. And then you get this, you know, this, this thing happening that is, that, that is, because you all come prepared anyway. For me, and I speak really of my own experience, my worst acting is always when I, I'm allowed to do the bathroom mirror performance. You know, I've got it ready. I've been rather good in the bathroom. I've been rather pleased with myself. I've got my various looks. I've got my various tones. I've got my various shifts. You know, I've got my passionate bit. And then I come and do it. And if anybody allows me to do it as I planned it, it's a bloody disaster. I then need to be told, yeah, great. You're now doing it on a unicycle. Um, and then something else happens. I exaggerate to make a point, but you see what I mean? And I thought you that first day I could see. And in fact, I see in that scene in the movie with the two of you walking down that, that field, there's something so vulnerable from the pair of you. Jude has to ask the question, are we going to leave Belfast? And you have to sort of try and react to that. And from both of you, it feels so, you know, not exposed raw, but it just feels real and touching. And it slots into the middle of the movie without effort. It's beautiful. And, and that is, that, that, that question is the, the kind of lingering, hovering question of this film. But at the anchor, uh, we have Katrina, we have Ma, you know, she, she's holding everything down at home. She's trying to raise these two, uh, you know, wrestling, rambling boys uh, in the midst of, of this just crazy um, upheaval of her life in this space where, you know, now her husband is away. Tell me a little bit about finding Ma and what it was about this story and in particular her predicament uh, that you tapped into in those early days. Well, I mean, she was, first of all, the, the character is so beautifully written. You know, I think very often we sort of, the female characters can get relegated to the sort of sidelines and, and not that much attention be paid to the enormity of their predicament. And I think what Ken did so beautifully in the script was really captured sort of the whole of Ma and everything that she was going through. And so there was the the obvious, the, the sort of the family issue that she was dealing with and how did she keep her boys safe and, and then her relationship with Pa. But there was this also beautiful personal battle that she was struggling with, which was this getting over her fears of you know, the unknown and all of this. So there was just so much for me to kind of grapple with and, and wrestle with. And what I loved was, you know, the ferocity of her as a mother and her her kind of watching as this place that she's always deemed as her safety net, her home, her streets, how it was turning against her and how it was becoming the thing that she was having to fear. And, but then that was also in some ways superseded by the fact that she couldn't imagine herself anywhere else because this was all that she'd known and it was such a beautiful kind of layer upon layer of all of these things and you know and i i looked definitely at you know my mom in a very different circumstance but also because of the troubles in a way had to leave her family and her safety net and sort of go towards the border um when i was a child and you know and i saw Sort of some of the costs that she had to pay for that in terms of you know losing her tight-knit community and, and all of that kind of thing so yeah it was it was very personal and um it just when i first read it you know it just it spoke to me in such a personal way and yeah it was just really beautiful and that is something very beautiful about this production as well, is that this story is so personal to all of you um, with kind of assembling this this very Irish crew here, uh, all with ties. And Kieran, of course, I have to pivot to you next then um, as another Belfast boy. You know, what does it mean to to be able to bring a story like this together and 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 to take this perspective of Pop, who is one of the wisest men I think I've uh, seen on screen in some time. Um, yeah, well, that's what you call acting. You're talking about wisdom there. Um, <laughs> it was very, uh, to, to us, the soul, it, actually, Katrina got it all right. It's uh, like, it all came from the script, from Ken's <laughs> mind, from his heart, from his soul. All this work came from him sitting down, writing a piece that when each of us admit, when we picked it up in our hands to read for the first time, it infused us with, uh, I guess, memories and, and, and truths that we knew from way back, but in our lives maybe hadn't confronted or been faced with it more recently. 
and when we read Ken's piece individually, it seemed to me that it, the, the, the whole um, essence of what he had captured was a, a really a deep truth of, of a culture and of people, but very economically and very, very personally, which then uh, through the structure of the piece seemed to open up uh, into a more uh, a shared experience from those uh, not from the culture. And uh, I do know that when we went to started to work on it, um, that Ken, it wasn't like being directed. It was we suddenly found ourselves we kind of slipped very gently into another world, into a, another time. I very gently eased and found ourselves when I was with uh, Judy in, in in our little terraced house, which was a, a set and it looked surreal. Suddenly, without knowing it, we were almost in a different time and. Uh, Ken allowed us the freedom to have fun, play around, but uh, we both found ourselves very kind of suffused with perhaps the uh, ghosts of our forefathers or the spirits of where we came from and took on that mantle. And uh, that's enough of me waxing lyrically, but it was a really wonderful um, experience to work on this and with Katrina and Jamie and that young scamp, as you call them, that young reprobate who's the bane of all our lives uh, but we know that uh, the world is a better place for him and uh, and and also we all know that working with ken has been a very magical experience oh don't don't think you're going to get out of, of talking too much more because there, there are more questions coming um and actually you know i'm gonna i'm gonna gonna go to one right now uh because one of the one of the lines that sticks with me every time is when pop says to buddy um and is it kind of assuaging his fears about moving to england that if people can't understand you then they're not listening um and i know that you know kind of when i i first watched this film and uh was was talking about it with folks and was like oh it's it's very irish everyone everyone is 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 you can you can tell that it is all quite authentic and and the idea was oh you know is there ever a moment where you can't understand someone? And the thought of it was absolutely not, because not only can I understand everything that everyone is saying, but also on like a deeper level, I've talked to people who are like immigrants who have said that this is their story as well. So I'm curious what you've what you've thought or what you've gotten um, kind of from that that whole that phrase there that you know if people. If, if if they can't understand you, they're not listening. So I'm just gonna, I, I took that like way deep down a different path. Um, but in particular, that scene is a favorite of mine and I would love to hear your thoughts on that line. I guess, I guess that speaks to us all in a way. And those of us also who are involved in the theatrical profession and we mix with a lot of different people from many different cultures and, and uh, different languages and different uh, ways of speaking the same language. And uh, it is very true that uh, even that fear when people hear a, a thick uh, regional accent for the first time uh, like in the center of England, they suddenly go, I haven't a clue what that man said. Right? But uh, I'm, I started off my career, I was working in the theater for a long time up in a great company in Glasgow uh, in the Citizens. And I come from Belfast. Then there's so many similarities between Belfast and Glasgow. They're both Celtic, fringe, hard, uh, urban uh, working class cities and uh, actors who would come up from London to work in the company any time on the street I became their official translator because they hadn't a clue what these Glaswegians were saying they just hadn't a, he said what, what did he say what did he say and because and yet from through a different path but I know what it means and I think we all do what it means to properly listen and it's in Ken's film the art of the art of listening to other people you know, and uh, I think when, like when we're introduced to people, when we say hello, we, sometimes we have to work at the names because names can be very complicated. But um, it is a thing that if people listen to you, then you feel more, uh, you get more, and therefore you can give more. Yeah, it is. It is about listening and understanding and and being willing uh, to mm -hmm. to put yourself in other folks' shoes. I think is one of the many 
takeaways from this film. Um, but this film is also a whole heck of a lot of fun. Um, even in reading the script, seeing, uh, Ken, your, your explanation of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and this brilliant scene in which you transport this family into the movies, you know, why was it so important to, um, you know, include that homage uh, to the film industry with a scene like that? And then I want to hear from everybody about how much fun it was to play that scene. Well, it, it, was, uh, it was about celebrating the fact that e even if only in the imagination, going to the cinema was a way of escaping, you know, an honest way, a positive way of escaping, being diverted for a while from anything that was overwhelming in your own life. And to be further overwhelmed by, in this case, color and music and imagination. It's a flying car. It literally takes you away over the clouds. And I sometimes used to think about the riot at the beginning of this scene, like the beginning of The Wizard of Oz, as if you're caught up in the tornado. And when that riot is over, all the pieces of Buddy's life have landed in bits, you know, and the film is about putting them back together. And one way to do it is through stories. And so you get a stories that are bigger, better, richer, different. And, and, and you experience it with other people and you feel that release, you're encouraged to escape in your imagination, you're encouraged to have that retreat into something that can be very beautiful and restorative or just flat out entertaining and fun. And um, in fact, uh, yeah, the, the, and, and everybody has different, different versions of what that meaningful moment at the, uh, at the movies is and uh you jamie wasn't yours were you it's like steve martin films for you is that right yeah i mean that was our uh the only time we ever went to the the pictures as a family all of us was a steve martin film that was that was it yeah like, i'd be brought maybe just me to watch it like indiana jones movies and stuff but it was if the whole all five of us were going it was only exclusively steve martin did you like steve martin films or did you were you dragged in because everybody else liked them? No, I, I, I loved them and, you know, in that sort of um, late 80s to, you know, mid 90s period when he was like white hot, you know, um, they, that was a good time to be going to see movies of his. And I'm try I sort of do try to carry that on a wee bit uh, with my own kids. I showed our eight year old um, just on YouTube, the scene from The Jerk where he's leaving the house and he's grabbing all the, the for, for me, that's some of the best physical comedy in the world, what he does in that in that scene. and. Just to sort of gauge with my daughter, like I really hope she finds this funny. Like, and even even out of context, it's funny. You don't even need to know what's going on in the in the, in the movie. So it was a, a strong time for him, and I'm 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 I'm, I'm glad. And actually, now I, I I just every time I think about Stephen Martin, I smile because it's such a tie in to good memories with the family. You know, Katrina, do you have a similar comfort movie or memory of movies? Oh, well, I, my town didn't have a cinema. <laughs> that's, that's what the borderlands were like in uh, Monaghan. Um, so, yeah, we didn't get a cinema, I think, until late, late 90s. Um, but we used to, so going to the cinema for us, we all had to get on a bus. And it was like a, I think about a 30, 40 minute drive to, to the nearest one. But I remember the first one was like a, an animated film, like All Dogs Go to Heaven. But I remember a big one, first one I was allowed to go to as a teenager was um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Oh. A huge one. That, was, that was a big moment. Solid. <laughs> and Jude, I, I know that uh, we were talking a little bit earlier off camera that Marvel may be uh, some of your comfort movies. Definitely. I love watching the Marvel films. Each and every single one is just like, I just enjoy it and I'm always quiet and I always just pair all the attention to the movie and it's it's very funny at times very emotional at times and it's all big mixed up and i just love it so much hey jude which of the marvel movies because i know you had a, you might have broken your record for spider-man but which of the marvel movies have you uh, cried most at or been most emotional at i gotta say um spider-man no way home uh, was the first film that made me tear a oh. bit and it's just, I cried four times during that film. It's, it's a work of art. 
So listen, how did you feel now? Now, how did you feel when when we were all on the road a few uh, like a few weeks ago and we got to Paris? And who should of all the towns in all the places in all the world, yeah. who should walk into our table but showbiz is Tom Holland? What was that like? Um, as soon as he walked past us, I realized who he was, and I just it's that moment whenever you're at like a point where you can easily just break and he spoke a word to me i broke and he just thinking about it now it's just <laughs> I, remember, I remember that that moment when he was so emotionally heightened and distraught he put a um a napkin over his head to hide do you remember that? Tried to hide behind a napkin, God love him. He was so embarrassed and thrilled at the same time. The thing is, I think also, I think you, you were incredibly impressed that Jamie Dornan knew Spider-Man. I think that's what, I can see that your whole, your whole impression of Jamie had changed completely because you gave Tom a big hug. I, uh, it's, it's, it's actually given him a reason to find me bearable. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because we were sitting at the table and Everyone was chatting away, and I was just. <laughs> and even now, I'm still tearing up. <laughs> I was going to suggest that your way into the the Marvel universe as an actor would be through Kenneth and Thor, since you know there's already that connection. But now, I I think you've got to start hitting up Jamie for that Tom connection. <laughs> yeah, we're 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 gonna we're gonna work on that. We're gonna link up a little bit more. Um, the, the cool thing is, Jude, like as soon as Tom sees Belfast, he's going to be a big fan of yours. Like That's the cool thing. Who, who <laughs> Jude, is the, um, the, the craziest person, aside from Tom Holland, that you've met or that has maybe said that they're a fan of this movie? Who have you heard really likes this movie? Wow. <laughs> Everyone. I, I, I can't fix it. It's just... Right. It's crazy all the names and then in the moment I'm just I'm terrible with names to be honest. The entire academy. <laughs> they were there. I was there too. And it was a it was a rous a rousing applause. Um then followed of course by a, a impromptu performance by Jamie of uh in, of everlasting love. Mm. A night that we can't forget. <laughs> Feels like a lifetime ago that the idea that, you know, we've like gone backwards since that in terms of our freedoms um which yeah it's that's sort of depressing to think about actually um, uh, jamie on the night did you uh, not that i wish to uh, encourage the audience here to indulge in drink but was there a had you planned that there might be an amount of drink or an amount of sips that would that would get you to the point where you were going to do that great big brave thing my father always said that um adults are always two gin and tonics below or above par and basically by that means that like that's the sweet spot that was his sweet spot like when he was two gin and tonics he was the best version of himself socially um but then if you have if you don't have two gin and tonics two, if you haven't had any yet you're you're a bit you know fearful or whatever and you've had two too many nobody wants to be around you so um i think i got that i think i hit my dad's sweet spot i think that, had um, my version of two gin tonics, which was two dirty vodka martinis, was just about perfect for me to find the sort of audacity and confidence to get up there. Well, I, I think there, attention also has to be paid to the idea that there's it's a full choreographed dance number as well. Katrina, you you had to get in there on screen, and then you and Jude recreated a little bit of it in the moment as well. Uh, well, yeah, I got abandoned, uh, so I needed a good dance partner, and Jude Hill was was ready to step up, and he he did some good twirls. Um, yeah, I mean that was such an amazing it was such an amazing uh, moment that Jamie did such a great job, and it was really good fun. But in the in the movie, it's such a great moment as well. I mean, it's so needed, I think, at that time, and it's such a it's such a romantic scene. I think even you know when you're filming something like that, it's it, it's you know you do sort of feel the the I don't know that that's sort of special magic of the, these moments you know you you sort of know that it's 
there's something so beautiful about it. And we had everybody in that room. Um, I think it was the day we had the most people sort of all together. we had been filming everything up to that point in very small, in small groups. Um, and it just felt so joyous and it felt so fun. And, and thanks to Una Niganila, our wonderful editor, I think she made Jamie and I look like fantastic dancers. <laughs> I'm not sure if we see the, the pulled back version, uh, we'd look, we come out of it quite so well, but um, it is, it's such a, it's such a beautiful scene. Jamie, one to five on the scale of, of your dancing. Oh, it's minus four, probably <laughs> I'm not a natural mover, really. Uh, the behind the scenes uh, footage of that day should uh, stay behind the scenes, I think, um, stay buried. It was, uh, it's, it's not my, my happy place, really, um, but, uh, you know. But he lies, can I just say, he totally lies. In all rehearsals, he's like, oh, I'm terrible at this, I'm terrible at this, I'm terrible at this. When it actually came to doing it, the only person who made mistakes was me. <laughs> and you're like, you had it down. That's, so. that's really, you know, it was, um, yeah, I mean, my ineptitude was matched by Katrina's, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you said, this is a, a beautiful, it's a beautiful tribute to Ireland. It's a beautiful tribute to Belfast. It's a beautiful tribute to family, love, romance, because not only do we have Ma and Pa and Pop and Granny, but let's not forget Sweet Catherine and that first love uh, between Buddy and Catherine and, and all can be fixed with maths made easy. <laughs> um, Ken, I, I know when we last spoke about this, Catherine had not in any way, and, and we know names have been changed to protect the innocent, had not in any way made an appearance. Do you know yet if the real Catherine has seen this movie? I don't know. I think I, w w the movie opens in the UK and Ireland on the 21st of January. So I'm waiting for uh, at some, some point, you know, north of that date, for uh, a knock on the door or a door on the <laughs> telephone the door. Is, uh, um, I'd be excited. Uh, and then, of course, they, they'd have to prove that they were the real person by knowing the real, <laughs> real name. So there would be a slightly sort of, could be a slightly sort of spy film kind of uh, reunion. So you, listen, you're going to be the first to know. We're just already also pitching the sequel. Uh, what what happens uh, when they meet fifty years later? And uh, Jude, do just prepare. Can can I can I write you a script? It's gonna be great. Well, thank you all so much for the laughs um, and to the audience for watching Belfast um, and for engaging with us in this conversation um, as. Ken said the film is still opening uh, around the world, but you can see it in theaters here in the U.S. So encourage your friends and family. Make it a family night. Thank you, guys.